Welcome, Lisa Howard. You're already laughing. You're already laughing at me. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's so good to see you. It's so good to have you on my podcast. I thank you for being here. My pleasure. Now, you and I, we just got through, this was a, a few months ago, we just got through with 42nd Street. And we, I mean, we, we had a blast. And now we never actually got to share the stage together. We were never really in a scene. That, I like, don't think so. Yeah. We crossed like ships in the night. Yes, yes. Backstage. Well, in fact, there was one time when as you were making your entrance, I had to leave. Yeah. So that was, <laughs> so that was pretty much. <laughs> yeah, that was it. No, I really, I really do think you, because you weren't in the group numbers. No. Your character. No. Yeah. No. But, but, but I mean, you had an absolute blast with that. I mean, you have a fun character with Maggie, who's just mm -hmm. kind of this kind of no nonsense, fun, loving gal. <laughs> so, writing shows. Right, right. It seems to fit your personality, that kind of character. I think so. And, and I think um, because Randy took the show in a more, I don't, I want to say kind of more grounded, real place. Um, I, I definitely feel like that's a little more me. I mean, I can be the big walk a walk out to the audience, you know, and there is a little bit of that just written into the character. Um, but uh, I, I really liked just playing her as, as a real person, you know, and, and, um, and just kind of having that, uh, freedom to be natural and not have to feel the pressure of like being sticky, <laughs> you know, but, but I think it totally worked too. Cause a lot of productions of 42nd street are very, you know, over the top <laughs> in that well, way. Well, yeah. It's that show within the show. And so most people focus on the show part, you know, and just try to give that, that, you know, yeah. razzle dazzle jazz hands to everything. <laughs> Yeah, but really it, the show part, we only had that one little quick thing. Most of my stuff was Maggie outside the show. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Now, now, 42nd Street, at least our, our production, it has a possible future potential where it's going to go. We don't know. Have, have, have you been in a lot of shows that kind of had that uncertain future? Um, sure, most definitely. Uh, starting with Spelling Bee, we first I did it as a workshop up in, you know, for no sense up in the uh, Berkshires. And it was just, you know, you had to do it because I was like, oh, this is a new William Finn piece. Yeah, of course, you know, but who knows? And then we ended up going to second stage literally just months later for like a, a very small production in the cafetorium at the school. And then we went right to off Broadway and then we went right to Broadway. So it was like, crazy fast but none of us knew it was coming and, and each all, time each of those steps along the way it was we it was were like, like whoa we're going here whoa we're going here you know it was <laughs> and it was so fast yeah so it was it was great were were you in touch because the you know the producer of 42nd street he was definitely in touch with us saying hey i'm trying to do this was that made aware to you during spelling bee um they would come to us and say, you know, like middle of the run, oh, hey, we're going here. Oh, great. There's going to be a product. And then, you know, middle of the run, they told us we were then going to off Broadway. And then we found out we were going to Broadway, you know, it, but it was very fast each time. It was, you know, it wasn't waiting around really at all. But, that, but from the very beginning, it, it, it was never really known what its future was going to be, really. No, like literally there from the winter of 2004, when there was just an outline of a sketch from, from an improv show that some of the cast had done, to Bill Finn writing songs where they're literally workshopping it, to uh, the, the next year rehearsing for Broadway. Hmm. All wow. those steps in between. Yeah, it was crazy. Like it never, you know, it never happens like that. So, well, through that entire rehearsal process, did it have that kind of improv feel, as you said? Mm -hmm. did, did it continue to shape and kind of mold totally. itself? Yeah. Oh, yeah, totally. Especially more like we, we'd be in the workshop and we would do something in rehearsal, and the next day it's in the script, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Hello, writing credit. Thank you. <laughs> um, and, you know, a lot, a, a lot of what I had to do was come up with stuff for the guest spellers, 
And so we would try out new ones in the room and, you know, they kept getting more and more ridiculous because, you know, in a rehearsal room, you're trying to make the people in the room laugh. And so it just got more and more ridiculous. And then we had some young students who were like intern writers too, and they would give us stuff and we would try it. And sometimes they bombed, you know, but, and we, we, we would do that during the whole run really try out new things. Even if we like looked over at a speller and they had some crazy shirt on, we'd be sitting there when the lights were low on us, trying to come up with something new to say about that particular person, you know? So sometimes they were only one offs and we never used it again or, and it either killed or sometimes you'd be like silent. Wow, and, wow. like, <laughs> <laughs> and that was the kids on the bench. That was when they would laugh the hardest on the, they'd be like, <laughs> when we would do it and they would just bomb. And I'd be like, <laughs> that has to be so fun though to have a show with that much freedom and spontaneity and newness every performance oh yeah and it was a one act there was no intermission it was like a 90 minute show start to finish boom you got it every show was different you know like it was it was great <laughs> now with that being your very first broadway show that it, it i mean it sounds like i've never been on broadway but it sounds like that that that's a very different kind of experience for a Broadway show. Oh, I, I think so. Most of, a lot of times, you know, it's in development and working for, you know, sometimes 10 years or something before something actually hits the stage, let alone gets a Broadway run or, you know, it just, this one was very unique in that way. And that it was such a huge hit, you know, we won the Tony for best book. Uh, Dan Fogler won for best actor. Like it was, it was awesome. Well, that, that leads us into the first story that you wanted to talk about, which deals with 9 to 5. Uh, a, a, another show that had, had its own like pre-Broadway run, you know, where is it going to go? How is it going to get there? And you say that that rehearsal process for 9 to 5 was actually the most difficult of any show that you've ever done. And you say that the creatives were constantly disagreeing and you would scrap a whole day's work, you would start over. Now, now, this is a musical based upon a popular movie, and so it had a script, it had a story. What exactly was being worked on or had to be figured out? I mean, we were working with amazing people. Joe Mantello directed, Andy Blankenbuehler was the choreographer. We had amazing people in the show, but I think maybe it was stylistically wise, uh, no one really knew, but we would do learn, take all day and learn a whole big group number. Andy would choreograph and everything. And then at the end of the day, Joe would come in and he'd be like, you know, and they, and then it was scrapped. And then we would literally start over. And, and Harada was in this. And I, I, on numerous occasions, she was like, I'm done. I'm quitting. I'm quitting. Like she was about to quit so many times wow. because it was just so frustrating for everyone. So like, I just think they just weren't agreeing on how it should look and how it should go, you know? And I mean, obviously eventually they did, but it was, it was a constant do and redo. Which sounds you know, like which, a workshop really more than, uh, cause we're, but it was during the rehearsal process. This is what I'm <laughs> saying. We were in, um, uh, it was that way I, when we were rehearsing for being at the Amundsen, which was our out of town run. I mean, there was a time, I mean, during tech, they're doing lights. We're in the lobby changing stuff, rehearsing in, in, in the lobby. Crazy. There was one time when they couldn't agree on this one number. And so we had a show, couldn't do it. We went out, stood still and sang. Wait, wait, wait. Eggy. Eggy, oh my God, because they couldn't, they, we didn't know what to do. Wait, wait, so during, during the show this happened? So you just yes, like- previews. Just, oh my God. Stood out there and sang and then left. We were like, what is happening? <laughs> that is crazy. Yeah. It's like, instead of doing something, do nothing, stand there, sing, and get off the stage. Uh-huh, for that wow. particular for, number. For that, for that particular number. Yeah, yeah. because, I, so it was ju it was challenging. I mean, we were having fun while we were doing it, but, like, eventually, we, everyone was like, oh, my God. <laughs> like, you know, so finally come to Broadway. We, you know, more changes, more changes. We're doing it. Um, then there was trouble with the 
I think the lighting designers, they weren't liking what they were doing. They ended up hiring a new set of lighting designers. The, the LED screen in the back, that was a problem and way over budget. You know, well, yeah, because this was at a time where that, that wasn't as common as it is now. Oh, it was like one of the first. And yeah. we were all like, huh, you know, this is cool. But it was, you know, expensive. And um, so I, I think there were a lot of hurdles in that way. You know, the set itself had this big ginormous hole in the middle of the stage that the desks would come up. You know, we had an accident during tech. Mark Kudish uh, thought the crash pad was there, jumped. It wasn't. I mean, he could have killed himself. He didn't. But, you know, and uh, Mark was like, well, I didn't die because I know how to fall. I mean, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so you know i mean it's true he rolled and lived, but he was all bruised i mean it was it was a lot yeah, yeah. <laughs> but once the show was finally up it was really fun it was a great show you know now, now did that fun did that only start on broadway or did you start to have fun even out of town oh we had fun out of town too except for the one number where we were like Standing there. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, now I read in interviews that Dolly Parton, obviously, this was her first musical, and so she was kind of trying her hand at this. But at the same time, she said it was a wonderful experience for her. Was she a part of that day-to-day -day rehearsal process? She wasn't there every day, but she was there a lot. And I don't want to paint such a negative picture. It was fun. I mean, and we were working with Dolly Parton. Like it was, it was great. You know, but comparing rehearsal processes that this process was the most difficult um it, you know during tech she would make us fudge and hand it and give us all like homemade fudge and um she would be backstage as we would come off you know you go to your gondola you change into your robe and you go up to your dressing room and she'd be there giving everybody high fives great job y'all great job you know i mean i was like oh was my so gosh funny. oh my gosh how fun that must have been yeah yeah, so it was great. And Nine to Five is a movie that everybody knew. You know, like, it's fun. We had Alice and Janney, Stephanie Block, Megan Hilty, Mark Kudish. I mean, that's a fantastic cast. Now, you know, now, so. now, each of those people, they're they are known for their voices, strong voices, except probably Alice and Janney. You know, she's, she's yeah. from the TV world. So was, was that taken into consideration as they doled out songs and duets and working I those numbers? Think, I don't think any of the songs she had to sing were exceptionally difficult. No, like the big power ballad, of course, that went to... Uh, Stephanie Block and, um, you know, Megan had some really sweet songs and, um, but Allison had her fair, fair share of songs, but they weren't terribly rangy or anything like that, you know? And, and I think, you know, for being in not really a singer, I think she did, I think she did a great job. With this particular production, since you were in the ensemble and there's obviously these, these big stars up front, was there that distinction or did it really feel like an, an ensemble, everyone working together? If I recall, I, I, I never felt, you know, I was in the lowly group or anything. It was <laughs> definitely a, a, a working together. Like I play, I was in the ensemble and I played Missy Hart, uh, the boss's wife, you know, just a little bit part. <clears throat> and um, so, I, I mean, I, ne I, I had scenes with them. Uh, I never, you know, there was never that atmosphere of us them, which some I know I've heard some shows can be like that, um, but no, I don't. I don't remember ever feeling like that. And was this because by this point you had done you'd done Spelling Bee, you'd done South Pacific, and in fact you you left South Pacific to to come do Nine to Five, right? Yeah, honestly, I was. You you always think. Oh, in my first Broadway show, I'm I'm going to be in the ensemble. I'll be second tree from the left or whatever. You know, having made my Broadway debut in a principal part, like that was amazing. Um, and then going into South Pacific at Lincoln Center, it was such a prestigious production to be a part of. It wasn't like, well, now I can never do ensemble because I've been a lead. You know, because <laughs> that's the thing. Once you get a certain number of credits, like you can't go back but I wasn't at that place yet it was my Broadway debut so um because I was the head nurse in 
um, in South Pacific. And that's definitely an ensemble part. Um, but you know, it was such a prestigious show and, you know, we get to work at Lincoln Center and work with Bart Sure, And, you know, um, so it was, you know, it, it was fine. <laughs> and then moving from that ensemble to the next ensemble, you know, that did, it just made sense. It was a parallel move. It wasn't, they're really stepping backwards, you know. What led to your decision to choose nine to five over staying with South Pacific? For one, I wanted to work with Dolly Parton because that's cool. And two, when I was in South Pacific, when I was originally cast, I thought that my role was simply head nurse. That was my ensemble track, and that was great. Like two weeks into rehearsal, stage management comes up to me and they're like oh and by the way um you're gonna be covering bloody mary i laughed i thought he was joking and he was like no i'm i'm serious and i was like do 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 agent <laughs> I was like, Whoa. i'm what i'm i had to cover bloody mary and um i didn't want to go on wow because hmm. yeah. This doesn't scream Bloody Mary. Right, right. I, the, I was like, this I was had a... to have dialect coaching. Yeah. Um, I had to do, I was like, I'm going to offend someone. Yeah. So, now, uh, I mean, uh, now it wasn't as woke a period as it is now, but no, even back but then, even then, I was that like, was oh. still like, wait a minute, that's not quite right. It's not quite right. Yeah. And this was, you know, back in 2008. And I was like, oh, I don't want to do this. You know, I had rehearsals. I was ready, if need be, if, if the time had come. And the person, Did you ever go on? Nope. No. The person who replaced me, uh, Liz McCartney, she, you know, she looks just like me. She had to go on. Now, thank goodness, I was a second cover. Thank goodness. Um, but, uh, no, I was like, oh, I got another show. Great. I'm out. Even though I would have loved to have stayed with South Pacific longer, but uh, you know, another show came along, another credit, work with Dolly Parton. I was like, this is a no brainer. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> this is no brainer. Now, now the reviews for nine to five were were mixed, but not necessarily horrible. And right. of the ones that I read, they they would criticize some elements of this direction or set design, you know, whatever. And when I saw it, that was pretty much my my experience. I could nitpick little things, but overall, I enjoyed the show. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's an enjoyable show because the music is great. The performances were great. Was, was there a sense that, um, that that enjoyment of the show was going to carry the day rather than these negative uh, reviews? Totally. Well, we thought we have stars. We have a really fun show. We have a known entity in nine to five, uh, you know, which is a cult hit. So, you know, like, it, it, you know, people know it and love it. Um, and, you know, it was very disappointing when we, you know, you start, and plus we're also in the ginormous theater of the Marriott Marquis, uh, which is notoriously difficult to fill those seats anyway. Um, you know, you start seeing those sales decline and knowing having the, the, the producing team having been, I think, over on the like set and lighting budget and, you know, ticket sales not being what they would have wanted i think you know i think they just pulled the plug yeah when did you find out when did the cast find out that it was going to be closing i think you know we opened in the spring and i think it was towards the end of the summer so it lasted longer than some of my other shows <laughs> <laughs> And how yeah. how did they present the closing? How, what was their reasoning behind it that they gave? Oh, well, they don't give you a reason. You just get a company meeting and they tell you the show is closing. You don't get, there's no explanation. <laughs> no one sits you down and shows you the numbers and here's our nut. And here's what we're pulling in. We've got to pay the invest. They don't tell you any of that. If it's just, you know, you just sit and pray every week and you look at the numbers going down and you're like, <laughs> and then you get that meeting and everyone's like, oh man you know so so was there a sense of seeing it coming or was it a surprise I, yes i think people were seeing it coming definitely and so what was that closing night like 
know, it's always bittersweet. And I remember we had a party, we went someplace afterwards, <laughs> uh, you know, like you do. Um, but it was fun. And, it, you know, you obviously, you always bond with a new cast and everyone, you know, you get to miss each other. And, but that's that thing, everyone, you always kind of have a foot out the door anyway, looking for that next next job and so it was like oh sorry guys hope this was you know we hope it was gonna last but uh c'est la vie well that takes us into the next story which was a, a few years later but this was escape to margaritaville and you actually thought that this was going to be your golden ticket. I mean, you got you got Jimmy Buffett music, you have the built-in audience, you have a fun story, and 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 your out of town run was actually pretty great. Now, now I, I actually had to look up, and this out of town run was rather lengthy, especially for a Broadway show. It was it started at La Jolla Playhouse in San Diego, then went to New Orleans, Houston, and Chicago. Now, was the show being worked on through all of these various cities? Yeah, definitely. You know, little tweaks here and there, new jokes, new this, you know. It was a fun, silly show with music, you know, um, uh, you know, and great choreography, you know, fun costumes. You're on an island and the, the volcano erupts. I mean, it's just Right. right. And, and now, they had to make up this story. It's not like 9 to 5 where they had an existing. They had to make up a story around yeah. his music. Was, yeah. was was that did that story continue to change or was did it stay kind of set once you were involved? <laughs> it, did, it definitely continued to change like through the workshops, through the out of town runs, you know, we had these characters who were like island zombies kind of <laughs> um and those definitely morphed over the time they're like what is this who are they you know but um different you know sometimes songs were replaced or you know added you know like you do in a rehearsal um but it was a, just a really fun show you know just fun and funny because um our writers uh also were um uh, TV writers too. And so the, I, I thought the comedy was hilarious, you know, like it was just, it was just a lot of fun and, um, with great songs and a great cast and, you know, you thinking that is a built in audience of years and years of fandom, you know, for Jimmy Buffett music. Now it wasn't the story of Jimmy Buffett. They took his songs and made a show like Mamma Mia, how right. they took ABBA songs made a story about it, you know, because let's be real. Mamma Mia, fun show. Is it a great show? No offense to anyone who wrote it or was in it. It's not a great show, but yeah. it's fun. And everybody exactly. loves the music. It is fun. It's silly. There's a romance story and you sing, everybody sings at the end in fun costumes, right? Was, was, this was is that, what I was thinking. And was that kind of the template thinking this is another Mamma Mia in that vein? Right. I, and and the, I mean, the writers weren't thinking that it was its own thing. But, you know, in my mind, it certainly is in that category. And, you know, and I, I personally thought it's a, a, a better actual show than hmm. Mamma Mia. So I was like, this is great. I'm going to ride this one, <laughs> ride it on out. <laughs> I'll be in, they're going to kick me. They're going to have to kick me out of this sucker. Right. You know, this is what I'm thinking, you know, I was like, I got my own dressing room. I'm here at the marquee again. It's at the Marriott marquee. Right. I should have, should have been, should have been wary. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> I think. Cause we obviously closed much sooner than I had anticipated. And I, I think it was your first year in a show. Success is based on the New York audience. And then the tourists pick it up once they've heard about it and heard good reviews. And then that's, you know, your second year and beyond is tourists really. And the New York audiences were not about it. They were like, mm, you know, was it, was it because it was Jimmy Buffett and that scene is kind of like lowbrow music and who knows, but yes, I think so. I, I, maybe he is more popular. You know, we were in California. We, it, it in any on tour it did great you know i just don't think the new york audience was in love with that and they i think they went in kind of like not ready to not like it hmm. 
you know. Well, it wasn't just Jimmy Buffett music. I was reading it's a it's a list of songwriters and other songs that were included. Do you do you think that 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 helped, you know, bolster Jimmy Buffett's music or distracted from it? You know, I don't know. It was mostly his and maybe he co collaborated with somebody on a certain song, but it was, you know, like that was the feel of the show. That island vibe is five o'clock somewhere, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, there, you got a beach ball. Beach balls dropped from the ceiling at the end. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> That's fun. <laughs> I mean, that, that reminds me. That reminds me of SpongeBob. They they had beach balls too. So maybe that's a clue. Like, if your show involves beach balls, think twice. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> maybe that's a clue. Maybe but, that's but, it. But but you say you had a fun time, and I've certainly had that too. Where it's it can sometimes be funner on stage for the cast than it can be for the audience watching it. Do you think that that's what happened, or or I mean, maybe, maybe. You had to know what it was. Like, am I saying this was a great piece of theater? No. It was escapism. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And so if you go into it with an eye of, I want to be moved, well, you're not going to enjoy yourself. Go get a margarita and come and laugh and see great da dancing and costumes and funny jokes and stuff like that. You know, I just think, you know, sometimes it's at the wrong time. For the audiences, like I bet if it had come after the pandemic, it might have done better because people are just like, I just need to escape, you something. know, something. give me something. Yeah, right. Well, it reminds me a lot of like Joseph and the Amazing Technical or Dreamcoat. It's just one fun song after another. It's not meant to change the world. It's not meant to. It's, it's just fun, silly songs done in a kind of tongue in cheek way. Yeah, you know, and you're like, do you know your Bible history? Here we go. <laughs> right. And I mean, kind of. I mean, sort of. Kind of, right. You, <laughs> yeah. know, you recognize some names and maybe some stories. Right. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I just think it was the wrong timing. And we were all just like, what? I don't, I, I don't, I don't get it, you know. So comparing Margaritaville, that rehearsal process out of town to nine to five, you you would say that you enjoyed Margaritaville? that process a lot more. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It was totally fun. Um, now, now, even though it was still changing, what do you think was the difference between the two? Oh, uh, probably just the energies in the room. Hmm. You know, it, it, it's just whoever's the mix of people, I think, you know, because it's always hard doing a new show because it's always changing yeah, like when you're in previews and stuff and like literally the writers come to you, you know, and you've got four new like joke lines <laughs> and a set of new lyrics and you got to do them that night. I mean, that's never easy. You know, it's, for me, it's much easier to put in a new line than it is to put in a new lyric. Like li literally, if I get a new lyric, my brain wants to explode. Like I, I, it it terrifies me. But a new line, I'm, I don't know why, but my, I'm like, okay, great. Got it. You know, yeah. I don't know. Um, uh, but it's a different way of processing, you, you know, like it's just, you just kind of have to go with your gut. Cause sometimes when you're in a long run or something that's already established and people say, know the lines or know the material. It's a lot different feeling, you know, when you're in a show and it's something that's already set and established and you're going in and doing it as compared to like, you're literally creating this now it's a new thing and you're, <laughs> you're just kind of going for it. But, but that's exactly what you did with Spelling Bee. That was very new and, you know, changing all the time. But that came more from you rather than these creatives giving you things. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and also, you know, the creatives too. But yeah, you know, it's, it's I have to say, I have been very blessed, very lucky to been in uh, five out of my six Broadway credits are um, new shows. Mm. I've only had to, to go in and replace once. And that was in um, uh, Priscilla. You know, so that's just go in and learn, here's the choreography. <laughs> here's, <laughs> here's your song, so go for it, you know. So I've had, you know, it's really such a different experience when you are putting up a show for the first time. Yeah. Now, you mentioned those New York re uh, 
the New York audiences and kind of turned their nose up at it. Was that a surprise based upon your reaction audiences in the out of town? Totally. Everybody out of town, we got every we got great reviews. And of course there's some <clears throat> mix in there too, but for the most part, it was a hit. Mm. It was, you know, people liked it. It was fun, silly, great music, beach balls, margaritas. <laughs> <laughs> Just remember, your 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 hair is just oh. getting there again. No, 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 no. Oh, you're fine. Start crying out loud. Oh, no, I know. You're just you just have such luscious locks. My long, luxurious <laughs> hair. No, you're fine. You're fine. It's it's more just it hits, and I I want to be able to hear you. That's I know. I Which I got highlights. Can you see? No, no. It actually does look really beautiful. I actually really like it. So thanks. Good job. <laughs> Good, job. <laughs> Good job. Good job. Good job. Good job. I'm proud of you. Thanks. Um, so when it comes to the closing of Margaritaville, it, did it kind of seem inevitable once the reviews came out, once audiences weren't really taking to it? Did it, yeah. writing was and, on the wall? Yeah. And you're just like, no. <laughs> you know, we're like, come on, Jimmy Buffett, can't you just float us for a while? I mean, you know, he just, <laughs> he probably has the money to do it, but of course he's not going to do that, you know? Um but yeah, of course, especially when you've been in the business as long as I have, and you're like, oh, no, here it comes. <laughs> you could just see it. Um, what, was Jimmy Buffett a part of that process? Was he more a lot. involved? Yeah, he was there. He was there a lot. I mean, he wasn't there daily in the rehearsal room, but he was there a lot. And sometimes um, he would come and do the do the like the bows and finale with us, and he'd come out and sing a song, you know, like, do a song, and we'd all sing with him. And it was fun. It was a lot of fun. We got to hang out and go out and, you know, really get to know he, him and his band. And he invited us when they go play at, um, what is it, Jones Beach, uh, somewhere out in New York. Mm. And they, oh, every year it's a huge concert. He came, we, got, we came and sang on stage with him. And it was awesome, you know, like, so we really got to know him and his crew and, um yeah, it's a lot of fun. And he, boy, does, he, he's a smart businessman, right? Right, right. He's not just creative. He's, he also has that the business smarts, yeah. Yep, yep. And for this closing night, it actually wasn't your last time to perform it, right? A few days later, you got to do something in Washington, D.C.? Yeah, we, we uh, had already been booked, I guess. We got to do the 4th of July celebration in front of the Capitol, so... <laughs> That was really way to go out with a bang, you know. Right, right. So you had your Fans closing of, night on the first, I believe, and then the fourth came, and you was like, "Well, this is actually closing, I guess." Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, we just did a couple of numbers, um, but uh, yeah, that was that was our really the way out. So that was kind of fun, you know. Wait, did the whole cast come back for that? Or yeah, okay. oh yeah. I mean, yeah. it was a couple of days later, so you're we like, <laughs> sure. Why yeah. not? Why not? <laughs> I could use the money. Now, for for this closing night, was it uh, was it just as as enjoyable? You know, obviously bittersweet again. Yeah, yeah. You know, especially when you're like, I'm never gonna, I'm not gonna see these people every day again. You know, you make the best of it, and we, we had kind of all felt it coming for a little while. So you know, you're you're geared up, you're ready to say your goodbyes, and plus, we knew. We were going to see each other in Washington <laughs> and get to do, you know, get to do it again. So, um, yeah, we still have a text thread that people say happy birthday to everybody. People share stories. Oh, someone got engaged. You know, like we have a text thread uh, oh, that we still kind of keep in contact with everybody. I have still we still have one for my spelling bee fam, too. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And texting was relatively new back then. <laughs> yeah. So we've all kept in touch. And like Dan Fogler sent us the most hilarious like New Year's or was it New Year's or Christmas? It, 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 a video just of him <laughs> just being goofy, you know, just sent it to everybody. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, connection in 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 that way. Um, and so, yeah, we're st I'm still connected with my escaped margarita bill cast and uh you know you get really close when you spend that much time at you know you get really close and then you're like okay bye it's not like people who have a regular job and they're at that job for 10 years and they see the same 
people, you know, like you're at a job, you're lucky if it's months, Mm -hmm. if it's years, whoa, you're really lucky, you know? So it's it's just a different thing. People come in and out of your, out of your life. And there's just a handful that you really still keep in touch with, you know? Well, for story number three, you wanted to talk about being a plus size late. Let me try that again. <laughs> right. Blah, blah. Hold well, on, I have story- to cough. <clears throat> <laughs> no, me too. I'm going to clear. I'm going to see up. Hold on. I guess my second cup of coffee. Hold on. <clears throat> I'm drinking vodka. <laughs> yeah, I'm fine. Me, 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 me. All right. I feel like it's going well so far. Oh, no, no. I'm enjoying it. I, I hope you're enjoying yourself too. I love it. <laughs> Okay. So for story number three, you wanted to talk about being a plus size lady in the entertainment industry and how that's really not for the faint of heart because just, just keeping at it and, and you hope that, that you never have to take roles where your weight is really a part of that character. And what was the first role where that was a part where, where weight was a central aspect of the character? Um, I actually think because Spelling Bee, it was not. South Pacific, it was not. Nine to five, it was not, which is amazing. Um, Then came It Should Have Been You, um, which was great. I mean, it literally was like the main plot point. Right. Right. It was a central theme. Yeah. Uh, You know, which is fine because it was very much so pertained to that story. But then after that came... Escape to Margaritaville, which it was, again, part of the story. And I was like, this cannot be a theme. I, I have to just be a person. <laughs> like, you know, um, because you often get, you know, pigeonholed and that's all you're seen as, which the industry is changing because now um, you see more and more people of all shapes and sizes and it doesn't have to be talked about. They're just people because it was almost like the elephant in the room. Like if there was somebody in a leading part, if you didn't, if they were heavier and you didn't mention their weight, it was like awkward or something, or they felt like they had to, to like justify why you were there or in the story. It was very strange. Hmm. Um, And you know, It just is, is difficult to be a part of that too many times where, you know, like it, you have to talk about it, (laughs) you know, because people go around their whole lives and they're just people, you know, um, can't they just be whoever and not have it be, uh, an issue that needs to be spoken about or joked about or laughed off or something. Um, so I, I feel like that is changing. Um, you know, which is, which is a good thing. And I mean, I would think, and just from looking from the outside, that that is more an issue when it comes to a plus size woman versus a plus size man. Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah. 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 No, no, it, totally. Um, and you know, it just depends on the story and it did, but so many interviews I've had and, and people bring it up like, wow, you know, you're a plus size look and you're still doing this, you know, and you're like, yeah, I don't know. I'm just me. And I've always looked this way and I'm just doing theater, you know, like I, I was, it, was it almost like a questioning, like, how can you do this and be plus size? Yeah, all of it. Any huh. question you can imagine or something. And also I'm tall too. I, it, I remember when I it, my early on in my career, my agent said something to me like the conundrum that is Lisa Howard, because if you're short and heavier, you're deaf. Oh, best friend role, best friend. You know, like you're not. Um, or if you sound a certain way, or you know, you're the funny gal. Or, um, but I was tall and curvy and pretty. People were like, I don't get it. Do you know? It was like, like it was a very like the conundrum that is you know so i mean honestly and there really aren't roles written for that <laughs> whatever that is you know so i really did just kind of forge on being like well i don't know i'm just doing it cuz there's nothing there's no real everyone's like what roles are you interested in i'm like well there's nothing really written for me 
you know, eventually I'd love to play Mama Rose and Gypsy, but you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I don't know, you know, because there was nothing. So I, that's why I was so glad to have come across a character, you know, like Rona. She's just a person who happens to look a certain way, you know? Right. Um, and so then once I started getting into the show at, uh, like a show about, you know, the main plot point is, you know, talking about your weight. And then the next one to be, I I almost didn't take Margaritaville because I was like, when I was doing the workshops, there were a lot more like literal fat jokes. And I was like, I can't, it's in, I, it's too much, you know, and they toned it down. They really did. If you, if, you know, um, they toned it down and it was part of the, plot point but in the end I mean I got the guy and you know he's like I don't care you know it 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 was good and but when we first started the show I was like this is this is a lot this is extreme can we not make it that like oh it made everyone in the room uncomfortable because you're like well well, yeah yeah I mean because it's yeah whenever you're pointing out someone's physical characteristic and it's kind of the butt of a joke it yeah. it's that 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 can be funny and you can do it lighthearted or it can be very awkward and uncomfortable because you're i like i'm right here yeah i'm it's... i'm standing here <laughs> cuz I, I am I, in the room cuz i i had a another guest on a couple of seasons ago and he was a heavier set gentleman who then eventually lost some weight but during his heavier phase he was often he he had a brother who was also bigger and they would do a lot of fat jokes or things that were centered around them being bigger yeah. and and so he was fine with that as long as he was the one in charge of where that joke went but a lot of times it was just okay well you need to get up now and then you need to fall on your face cuz that's funny you know it was like put a on him like because you're bigger we're going to put you in these situations exactly yeah 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 so it's it has definitely been um a challenging part of my career and i've had to talk about it in every interview known to man well now you brought it up here i did of course well that's (laughs) but that's purposely because you were talking about what's a challenge or what has been a challenge in, you know, in in this industry and that being one of them. So I know I brought it up, Um, but only because like everybody asks you about it Hmm. and you're like, huh? Okay. (laughs) Now, (laughs) now, I mean, I'm trying to think through like, yes, yes, yeah, someone who's bigger stands out from someone who's skinnier. But I, I would also say that, that in reverse, someone who's really skinny stands out from someone who's... So why do you think that your size is such an issue or has been such a focal point? I think because it's still the last, like, taboo thing in our society. And it's, it's still something that people think it's okay to make fun of someone about. You know what I mean? There's so many things that are PC and, but I have to say in the last, everyone's, you know, the culture is shifting most definitely. Um, but it was, st- it's, it was still something that people were shunned for a shame, made a shame to feel ashamed for, um, so many, uh, things about it um that when you are on stage for one you stage somehow height everything's exaggerated when you're on stage so me being tall and big like I'm a big presence on stage I can't tell you I cannot tell you how many people meet see me on stage and then meet me afterwards and they're like oh you're like normal size (laughs) on stage you look like a giant and you're like (laughs) Thanks. Bless you. <laughs> Bless you. I, I, I realize that. I've heard that literally after every show. Like someone oh. will meet me at the stage door and I'm I'm five eight, you know, and they'll be like, oh, oh, you're just like normal. I'm like, yeah. Yes, I am. <laughs> you know, when I go to the grocery, nobody looks twice at me. Do you know what I mean? Like if I'm out, no, you know, I'm it's not like crazy, but on stage somehow it just magnifies everything. You know, so people are always like, oh, huh, look at that. And and how has this messed with your own perception of yourself? Um, I don't know it would necessarily say messed with it, but there's 
there's always going to be baggage from, especially growing up in the time I did of, you know, having, um, what do I, what's a good way to put it? Weight issues or, you know, like not being necessarily the healthiest weight. And I don't know what's the best way to, to put that, but like, I mean, I've literally, you know, been that type my whole life. So it just is who I am. And then there's some parts of you're like, well, if it's so wrong, it does make you feel like, okay, well, there's something wrong with me then, you know, because I've never been this other thing. It's not like I was thin in my youth and then gained a bunch of weight, you know, like I kind of looked the same. There was a period, especially when I was having babies that I was a little heavier. And <laughs> so then I've lost, a, you know, I'm back down to where my, I, I was, <laughs> you know, um, so, yeah, I don't know about me- like necessarily messed with me. I could see if I was once like felt muscles and all that and then I changed. I can see if that would really mess you up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I'm like, I don't know. It's literally always been what I've looked like. You know, when I was younger, of course, I was thinner. And I'm like, God, I wish I still looked like that. But it's been still in the same ballpark, you know. So I, I can't really say that it's completely something's completely shifted. It's just I am who I am. And and maybe that's why I've just been able to been like, well, I don't know. I'm just going to do what I do. And somebody's going to cast me in something, you know, which is obviously proven true. Let me knock on some wood. Cause you never know when your last show is going to be. <laughs> um, so I don't know if anything really, if it definitely shaped, but you know, and being in, in society and having all those negative messages around what that means to be heavier, um, you know, because it, if for someone who's never struggled with it, they just think you're lazy or have no willpower. And it's not necessarily the case. It's not what it is uh, really, you know, like everybody just processes things differently or it's what your family, you know, your family patterns and all of that stuff. Like there's so many things that go into it. And so there, there's definitely still a, I feel like in society in general, looking down upon people, you know, someone, if you're not this, well, you must, you're doing something wrong. You're lazy or, you know, you're ignorant or you just don't have any willpower and therefore you're somehow less. And does that, does that perception, does that tend to just kind of roll off your back and you're able to keep going or do you fight against it and get angry at it? How do you respond? No, I, I, I definitely don't get angry. I don't really fight against it, but there have been times, I guess, you know, for me, it kind of is what it is, but I also, I think it has had me set expectations of, I know what the industry is. I know what they're going to cast. And I know I'm not going to get that role. I haven't been like, Oh my God, I really, I could do that role. I'm like, sure. I probably could do it really well, but I know I'm not going to cast, be cast it. So I'm going to go for that role. You know, I just, you just have to be smart about it. Like if you know what the industry is and you know, if I look like a giant on stage, I'm not going to get cast. (laughs) You know, like you just have to be smart about it because that is what it is. Now, granted, nowadays, in the past several years, casting and people in general are having a broader vision of what it's okay to look like, which is great which is great. So I have to, I, I most definitely felt a shift in that story, you know, which is great. Cause you see, um, what was it? The last show Bonnie Milligan was in, she was a key, the lead character and it was never mentioned. She just was who she was. Fantastic. You know, like she just was, she was just a person and she just happened to be that character, you know, exactly. and it wasn't a plot point. Thank God. You know, so I, I, I'm, I anticipate more things like that coming because there are so many people, especially, you know, nowadays, I I think even with fashion, people are, you know, people are just being more accepting of different people and different bodies and different (laughs) genders and all the things, you know? So I, I think we're on the right path. 